TYT Sports, as many of you may know, we are doing another countdown to kickoff series, and we are starting in Tennessee with Tom Abraham of Sports Radio 560. Tom, congratulations on being the first on countdown to kickoff. Well, this is the first thing that the Titans will be first in this year, maybe, so that, that's a good thing. <laughs> okay, optimism off the gate. I really like it. Uh, let's start off with Jake Locker. You know, he has zero career starts. He was named the starter in camp on Monday. He beat out veteran quarterback Matt Hasselbeck. Meanwhile, Hasselbeck is now being paid $5.5 million to sit on the bench. Let me ask you, Tom, was there any reason in delaying the inevitable to give Jake Locker the nod? No, and that's what happened here. I mean, it, you know, the, we use the term loosely beat out. I mean, they're about the same guy, but there's a lot of upside with Jake Locker. And Hasselbeck knew, you know, right from the beginning when he came in here that, you know, he'd have an opportunity to start and then compete. And for, the, you know, Locker, he would have had to fallen over, you know, with a heart attack on the field probably not to be named the starter on opening day. So I think that that's what was in play there. And, and they're not afraid to pay Hasselbeck the $5 million to be a quality backup. Uh, throughout this year, I mean, Locker is, is uh, you know, I think they're going to want to wait and see, and there's an opportunity for Hasselbeck to play uh, still early on if, if it doesn't go well and you know you're bringing in a guy that can help you. But the thing with Matt Hasselbeck is, I mean, if you want to go 9-7, and seven, if you want to have maybe a little better shot at beating New England, you want Matt Hasselbeck. But if you want to win and play for a championship within the next two or three years, you got to see what you got with Jake Locker. I mean, it's time to see what he can do. He's a dynamic kid and a dynamic leader. And, uh, you know, so this is, the, this is the way to go. Known quantity versus upside. He is being expressed from his teammates as a very mobile quarterback. He had a 21-yard run against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the preseason. Very agile, very athletic. How else would you describe this guy? Uh, I would describe him as smart. He's a quick learner. He's got a strong arm, and uh, you know, he, and he's the kind of guy that is. He'll only make a mistake once. I mean, he, you know, it seems to be that he doesn't make the same mistakes over and over again. So uh, I think that's what you, you you see with him. He he can do things in the pocket, but I think they want to move him because when he's on the move he seems to throw the ball. His accuracy actually goes up when he's on the move, and it may be because he doesn't think about mechanics as much. So, uh, you know, he's a slippery guy. He's a playmaker. Hear me out on this very quickly. Chris Johnson, obviously we all know he had the amazing season when he ran for over 2,000 yards. His quarterback that year was Vince Young for the most part. Kerry Collins was in there as well. He has another mobile quarterback in Jake Locker. Do you foresee him having a breakout year as defenses have to zone in at least one defender you take out of the play with a mobile quarterback? I think that that will help Chris Johnson. I think the bigger help to Chris Johnson will be Jared Cook and the emergence of him as a tight end, where if you if you suck up on Chris Johnson on play action, Jared Cook's going to be running down the middle of the field open. I think if Kenny Britt decides not to enlist in the Army in the middle of the night or whatever he was trying to do when, when he got that uh, DUI yep. at Fort Campbell, however long that suspension will be, he, he's physically ready to go, but that uh, suspension is looming. Uh, but that's going to help him quite a bit. And Kendall Wright uh, is another weapon that, that looks solid. So those things on the perimeter are what's going to help Chris Johnson. And keep in mind, you know, he can talk all he wants about C.J. 2K and C.J. You know, wanting to go for 2,500 and uh, break the record and all of this. He needs to be C.J. 1.5K. They're a better football team if he gains 1,500 yards and Jake Locker throws for 3,000 yards, and Chris Johnson has another three or 400 yards in receiving, you know, that kind of thing. If, they get, if Chris Johnson gains 2,000 yards, they're an 8-8 eight eight team again, which is what they were the last time when he did that. So, you know, the, the, uh, the correlation between winning and being that kind of a running back, the last three running backs to lead the league in rushing all came out of the AFC South. Uh, Jones drew last year, Aaron Foster, Chris Johnson. None of them made the playoffs that year. So that's not the formula you know, CJ can want to have all those accolades and be a great fantasy player all he wants. The team wants to win, and they, so he needs to be part of that, not not the, the the singular player. Is there a duty then on the head coach to reel him into his office and sort of talk to him and try to look? We're, we're only we can only judge on what we're given through quotes and with media days and all this all this stuff. Him saying that he wants to rush for another 2,000 yards and them still being an eight and eight team. When does he put the personal accolades aside? and try to focus on the bigger picture, the team. 
Yeah, well, we've had Coach Mike Munchak on several times out at training camp, and it's interesting because Munch being an ex-offensive lineman, having his best friend Bruce Matthews, both guys who hang yellow jackets, you know, uh, up in the locker room on game day uh, as Hall of Famers, um, you would think that they'd want to run the ball a lot, but they actually they understand the new NFL. They understand that this is a passing league now, and uh, you know, and Munch just kind of blows that stuff off. He, he jokes about it, and he knows that he wants out of Chris Johnson, you know, thirteen to fifteen hundred yards, the threat of the explosion, and it's not it's not all about Chris, you know, and it, it just he's 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 always he, he's kind of always had that mindset, and if he's striving for that, that's fine. But as Munch said, I'd like him to see him. I'd like to see him get six yards on the next carry. I don't care if he gets two thousand yards. I want him to get six yards on the next carry. And uh, you know, and that's the kind of coach Munch is. Is that he, he just kind of he always pulls them back in and reins them back in, so to speak. Chris Johnson and the Tennessee Titans average eighty nine yush- rushing yards <laughs> per per game. I swear I'm going to say it correctly. Let's try that again. They average eighty nine rushing yards per game last season. Talk about the wide receivers for a little bit. Start with Kenny Britt. You know, he had a breakout season last year in what you could say is a season with just two games under his belt. He looked like the perennial receiver that the Titans need. However, he had surgery on both knees. You also uh, told us about his DUI that he received. You got to think it will be at least a one game suspension. Do you see him coming back by week two, possibly? I, I think it's at least two because I think he's going to get clipped for cumulative uh, bad acts, you know, going back further. And the thing about Kenny is they're all kind of little. The guy gets here arrested in the stupidest ways. Who gets arrested, uh, you know, trying to get out of Fort Campbell on an, uh, on an Army base, you know, at 3.30 in the morning uh, drunk? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Who gets, who gets arrested by cops standing in line at a car wash with a blunt in his hand? I mean, it, 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 it's just a goofy stuff. He, you know, one of the things where he was, uh, you know, uh, bail bondsmen were coming after him because he failed to uh, make his obligation because uh, one of his buddies was up for uh, a trial and he pledged to bond the guy out, then never gave the bail bondsman the money, so the uh, bail bondsman had him. You know, I mean, it's just crazy stuff. And and so you know, he's a decent guy who makes these terrible decisions, and he's not a kid anymore. He's like 24 years old now. He's got tons of talent. You, you were right about using the term season loosely with him. I mean, a season for Kenny is you know five, six games, and you're ahead of the curve. He's never played the whole season, so keeping him healthy is key. Conditioning is always an issue with him. Um, but he's got all the skills. I mean, there's no question about it. He's extremely skilled. And, you know, when you add in Nate Washington, who had 74 receptions last year, over 1,000 yards receiving, uh, Kendall Wright, who is a faster version of Nate Washington, who, who, who will go out there and block downfield for the, for the running backs, who was a very smart kid. You want to talk about a bright kid. Kendall Wright is picking up everything really quickly. Uh, he's going to be very explosive in the slot or otherwise. So they've got some parts there. And, again, the tight ends. This is always going to be an offense that's utilizing the tight ends. They love Craig Stevens. And, and Jared Cook is the one that's going to break out. I mean, that's the guy that's on the verge of, of stardom. And uh, in this contract year of his, I mean, I look for Jared Cook to have a huge year. From what I've been reading in camp, Derek Morgan is reportedly not taking the reins on the starting defensive end job. On the other side of Cameron Wimbley, Pinnell Egbo, I believe his name is pronounced, mm-hmm. a practice squad player, has certainly, from what I've read, been beating him out. And he's a, seems like, at least from, again, what I've read, that he is a solid run, uh, solid against the run. Would you say that Derek Morgan is going to start in that defensive end spot come week one? I think he'll split time with Egbo. Uh, Egbo, is, uh, is, 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 your reports are correct. I mean, he has looked really good. He's a big, athletic-looking guy, and uh, I can see him splitting some time there. I also see Morgan, as I said, getting some of that rotation. Remember, it's such a passing league. You're going to want to have, you know, uh, probably one, um, you can have one guy in there that's that grunt kind of guy, you know, and that, that most likely will be Carl Klug and sometimes Jarrell Casey, and they'll go a lot with Morgan inside and either Egbo or Akeem Ayers outside and Wembley on the other side. So I think you're going to see some looks like that. But uh, this is a very, very important year for uh, um, Derek Morgan because he just he was never hurt in college, and he was outstanding in college, and he just hasn't been able to stay healthy. So if he stays healthy, I think you'll see him move to the next level a little bit. A few more questions for you, Tom. The cornerback play, obviously they lost Cortland Finnegan to Jeff Fisher's St. Mm-hmm. Louis Rams. Who will possibly step up and become the shutdown corner that Cortland Finnegan was? 
Well, that that is going to fall to Jason McCourty, but they don't have that shutdown type corner where one guy's going to take out half of the field. It's going to be, you know, really you're going to see three guys in there a lot: Elteron Verner, another UCLA guy, Jason McCourty, and then uh, you know a, a kid that really is uh, has done a nice job uh, for them is Tommy Campbell, and this is a big guy, six foot two, six foot three guy that uh, was kind of one of these little finds late in the draft. He was picked last year as a seventh rounder, just like Finnegan was. So Tommy Campbell is a, is a name, number 37, that you'll look at quite a bit there. You'll see him in there. I think they'll move Werner inside to the nickel when uh, when they go to a, a nickel look back there. And the, the, the bigger issue is, I mean, they gave a lot of money to Michael Griffin, who's a, a fine free safety who, you know, at times lets his mind drift. But who's going to be the strong safety? And, you know, Jordan Babineau was taken off the scrap heap last year, and they gave him a contract this year. He's scheduled to be the starter, but they've worked in some different guys there as well. And, you know, the safety play, that's that's the whole thing. The safety play and the corner play is, the, is going to determine how good this team is going to be. It's going to be about that back four. Last question for you, Tom. The opening four games are simply <laughs> brutal for, for the Titans. They host New England. They go to San Diego, in which they have struggled in the past. They host Detroit. And then they go to division, division favorites, Houston, to recap the uh, first four games. Over under in Vegas is saying seven wins. What do you say about that? I think that they're. I think it's a little light. They never get any respect. I mean, they're. They're. It's a you know smaller market, and and they generally are not going to get a lot of respect. The thing in, with the with the schedule is is that it's back loaded. When you look at the back end of it, it you know it becomes a little bit easier where they get mm -hmm. Jacksonville twice. You know, in the end, they get Indianapolis. Who knows how good they'll be? You know, in that last uh, stretch of games, they they play at Miami. Um, so in the second half, two Indy games, two Jacksonville games, a game at Miami, a game at Buffalo, you know, those are games that they can be, um, that are toss-up games to a certain extent. However, I also looked at the Vegas numbers, and I saw they're only, they will only be favored. Right now, if you, were, if you were running the numbers, they'll only be favored in four games, which is, which is really, and, and one of them's a toss-up, the Jets game at home, and who knows what the Jets are going to look like by December. Right. That could be a dumpster fire there, or they could be great. So, um, so it's going to be very interesting. They, they have to figure out some way, if, it, if at all possible, to get out of this first four. You know, if they can get through this first four two and two somehow, you know, then they're that team that's going to be an eight or nine win team. And if they're a team that is playing late in the season uh, to be nine and seven again, um, or, or if they get something to fall their way and, and, and can get a tenth win, you know, they're, they're that team that's going to battle. This, could, this division... I'm not 100% sure that Houston has improved themselves that much. Uh, I think the Colts are going to be a little bit better than, than some people thought. This division may be one of those years where this division could be won at 9-7. and seven. It may be like that. Uh, and it come down to those two games against Houston most likely. So what do you see? I mean, do you see them going 8-8, eight and 9-7? Eight, and seven? You sound very yeah. optimistic. Yeah, I, no, I got to admit, I, I gotta admit that I, I, think they're, I think they're, I mean, they were 9-7 and seven last year uh, with no... Uh, off season at all. They started four rookies on defense. Those guys are all better. Colin McCarthy, Akeem Ayers, Klug, uh, Casey, all those guys are better than they were a year ago. Uh, you know, so I, I have a hard time thinking that they're worse than last year. So, you know, when I look at last season at nine and seven, I think they're right there again. I think they're eight and eight, nine and seven type team. Uh, I would lean towards nine and seven. So I think that it's uh, a little better than what Vegas thinks, but that has been the case, except for the 13 win year. Uh, a few years ago, they always outperformed the over/under out of Vegas, and I think that that staff is underestimating. They're underestimating Mike Munchak and that, uh, and that staff. I completely agree with you. When I was going through the schedule last night, I was looking at the back end as well, and you see the Colts, and you got to think that they're not going to get swept by the Texans. I would have to think they'd win the later game down the road. Mm -hmm. Two games with Jacksonville. I completely agree with you. I actually wrote down eight and eight, nine and seven. If you guys yeah. don't believe me, I will literally zoom in on my paper. Tom Abraham of the Tom Abraham Show on Sports Radio 560. Where else can everyone find you? Well, at uh, TomAbraham.com. They can listen online there, the Tom Abraham Show Facebook fan page. Uh, our show is also carried in Kentucky on uh, 103.9 uh, WNTC. So there's a lot of ways out there on the Internet that you can get it. And they have all kinds of, I, uh, 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 you know, the, the audio files and things like that where you can listen to the uh, podcast and things like that. So it's, uh, it, there's a lot of ways these days to, to catch it. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tom. We really appreciate it. And good luck with Brandon Weed and, and the Browns as well. <laughs> yeah, that works out. Thanks, man.